Hello and welcome to the Contrabassoon Masterclass for the YouTube Symphony Orchestra. I'm Dominic Morgan and I'm Principal Contrabassoon with the London Symphony Orchestra. First of all, we'll look at Ravel's Mother Goose Suite. This is the, the, the best known and probably the most important contrabassoon solo that we have. Um, the, the, the contrabassoon represents the beast, which I think probably is m maybe a serpent, something like that, something that's slithering around. So we want to try and convey that uh, in the music. Um, I shall play a little bit for you. These first two phrases, which are the, the most crucial, um, are marked piano and mezzo forte. And if we play them piano and mezzo forte, they're not going to come across the orchestra. So we actually, it's a real solo piano. So we're going to begin really mezzo forte for the first phrase and probably forte for the second phrase. And I think it's also important to play right through the phrase. You will, you will often hear people breathe before the low note in the phrase, which to me breaks it up. We have to think of the line and to play it all in one breath. And w where the tune comes back at figure four, um, it's, a, it's marked a little quieter. So we, we are going to play this quieter and um, it, it leads to figure five where we have a, a top B flat, which is really unusual, a really high note for the instrument. and. You may not know the fingering for this note, and it's fingered with the, the lower speaker key and the C-sharp on the left thumb and the middle finger of the left hand. You have to be able to slow up from the C below it to that B-flat. And just after figure five, there are a couple of triplet passages which, which are quite tricky technically and the, the instrument doesn't always support the pitch, particularly if the reed is slightly too soft and it sometimes helps when, particularly when fingering the E flat, which can sound rather flat, it can help to, to put down something in the right hand, prob probably the middle finger of the right hand to support, help support the pitch. As you can, you can hear, it's a little sharper. So that may help us in, in those two little passages there. There is, there is one more thing to talk about um, in the section from figure four. Um, between bars, going bar 14 to 15, there's a slur from the tenor C sharp down to a D. Now, in order to facilitate that slur nicely with a diminuendo, it's quite good to use a mute fingering from the D for the D. So rather than just the two fingers which we would normally use for a D, I'm going to add the first finger and third finger of the right hand, which mutes the D and really aids the slur. So in, instead of it sounding rather, rather uh, difficult, which would be with, without, the, without the mute fingering, which is it's a, a quite a bright sound. It helps to use the mute fingering, which makes a much more stylish slur and diminuendo. So bearing those things in mind, I'll now play the whole extract. And it's important to think about the line and the music, where the music's going, and what's going on around it.
And the last moment of Brahms 1, this is something else that is very often asked in auditions and it presents quite a number of different difficulties. First of all, from the very opening, it has to be very, very quiet. Um, in context, there's nothing else going on really. We come in, I think, with the violas and the cellos and the basses and it feels very, very lonely. So what we have to do is try and use a mute fingering for the C. So instead of just playing a straight C with the three fingers of the left hand, I'm going to add the middle finger of the right hand, which will help it come in quietly. And then two bars before A, we have to come in very, very quietly on a bottom E. This is just down to having a good read. Uh, there's nothing else we can do about it, really. And this is also another, in context, quite a lonely entry. next important passage which often comes up in an audition is from figure C. It's only uh, five bars but it's uh, the bass line of the chorale, the trombone chorale and it's one of the most wonderful passages you ever play and it's really the second most important voice so although it's marked piano dolce you do need to play it quite loudly um, and very different condu conductors will ask for different things uh, so it's nice to play it evenly to begin with, but very often the conductors will ask to hear the bottom E flat and the bottom C. So sometimes you may have to play those quite a lot louder. And you have to play with, what, with the sound that's coming from behind you all the time. So you have to have this sense of where they're breathing, where they're going to play. One of the things that people will be looking for when you play this in an audition is that the bottom C speaks properly. And one way of ensuring that that happens, because it's quite a big jump from the octave above, is to finger half of the bottom C when you play the, the higher C. So when I play the C in the middle of the stave, I'm going to put down these two fingers at the same time. So I'm half fingering the bottom C, which makes this jump much easier. Also for the, the D in the second bar, I'm going to use a, a, this mute fingering again, which is 
the first and third fingers of the right hand. But otherwise, this is a rather, it's a rather bright sound. Because what we're looking for, we're looking for a, a really mellow sound to blend with the trombone. Uh, in the last movement of Brahms 3, at eight bars before N, there's quite a tricky technical passage in the tenor register, which you'll often be asked to play in an audition. It's really to see whether you've mastered those rather awkward fingerings. And it, this is quite useful for looking at how we might practice something. Um, it's always a good idea to break things down and to, to play games with them and make patterns just to, so you can go over and over something and change the rhythms, anything which helps you learn those tricky fingerings. So really, it's the fifth bar before N which is difficult. And if we put that together with the sixth bar, we can create some patterns to try and get those awkward fingerings uh, under the fingers. Uh, first of all, I would just play it over and over again slowly. <laughs> a little quicker. And then we might think about changing the rhythms. It's very useful to practice things in dotted rhythms very often. might change the dotted rhythm the other way around. And then I might also take just the first part of the fifth bar before N and isolate that. So all these different ways of practicing should enable us to play it all up to speed. So thank you for watching and I hope you found some of this useful. And if you're going to take part, then good luck because this is a really worthwhile project. So have fun and enjoy it.